Marlene, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My uh, my name is Sebastian Perros. I'm a research professor working uh, at the Central Asia Program at the IRIS at George Washington University. Uh, welcome to uh, the Central Asia Program seminars. Uh, so today we have a kind of uh, exceptional event. Uh, why exceptional? Because we have the editors of four books uh, of four edited volumes dedicated to uh, Central Asia, which have been recently released or are going to be released uh, next year. And so these volumes are uh, in order of publication, uh, the Routledge Handbook on Contemporary Central Asia, which has been edited by Rico Isaacs and Erika Marat. The second one is uh, the European Handbook of Central Asian Studies, History, Politics and Societies, which uh, uh, has been edited by Jeroen van den Bosch, Adrian Fauve and Bruno de Cordier. The third one is Central Asia, Context for Understanding, which uh, uh, has been edited by David Montgomery. And the uh, fourth one is a Central Asian World, edited by uh, Jean Field de la Croix and Martin Reeves, uh, which is going to be published in the Routledge World Series. So, I, there's three, there's, there's volumes, there's four volumes, three really demonstrate uh, the importance of uh, the field of study on Central Asia. I mean, the diversity of topics, since all these volumes are uh, based on uh, different approaches, for example, in terms of disciplines, some uh, integrating uh, several disciplines ranging from, uh, let's say, history to economics, also focusing maybe more on one discipline, such as anthropology. Uh, there's also diversity in terms of audiences. I mean, some aimed at the public of researchers uh, or people already uh, who already have knowledge on Central Asia, on the Central Asian region, while also may be aimed at a wider audience. So, the point of this seminar today is not only to ask actually the editors uh, to present their volume, but also to discuss the state of the discipline of Central Asian studies. So we are happy to have actually uh, one editor of each of, uh, for each of this uh, volume. So we'll start with uh, Erika Marat, uh, 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 who is an associate professor at the College of International Security Affairs and uh, at the National Defense University. Uh, Erika Research focuses on uh, violence, mobilization, and security institutions in Eurasia, India, and Mexico. And uh, Erika was also a visiting scholar at the Kennan Institute at, of the Woodrow Wilson, Cent Wilson Center. And besides, so this edited volume that she's going to talk about today, uh, Erika published in 2018 The Politics of Policy, uh, Policy Reform Society Against the State in Post Soviet Countries, uh, which was published by Oxford University press. A second speaker is the Jeroen van den Bosch, who got his PhD at Adam Mishkevich University in Poznan on the topic of personalist rule in Sub-Saharan Africa, which was uh, actually recently published uh, as a book, I mean, to, uh, by Routledge uh, in 2021, this year. So Jeroen uh, continues working on authoritarian ecosystem as an independent scorer, and he works at uh, Adam Mishkevich University as a project coordinator and currently coordinates several Erasmus Plus strategic partnerships. Uh, his research fields encompass theories of dictatorships, their classification, autocratic cooperation, democratization, political regime theories, bridging international relations, and dictatorship research. Uh, our third speaker uh, is a uh, David Montgomery, who is a research professor in the Department of Government and Politics and the Center for International Development and Conflict Management at the University of Maryland, College Park. Uh, David is also the Director of Program Development for uh, CEDAR communities, so communities engaging with difference and religion. Uh, his books uh, include Central Asia Context for Understanding, Practicing Islam, Knowledge, Experience, and social navigation in Kyrgyzstan, 
and uh, living with difference, how to build community in a divided world, and uh, one, one more, everyday life in the Balkans. And last but not least, Madeleine Reeves, who is a professor of uh, social anthropology at the University of Manchester, where uh, she has taught on the anthropology of the state politics and post-socialism. Madeleine has a research interest in borders, place, infrastructure, and migration, and she's currently developing new research on infertility, reproductive uh, care, and the political economy of health in Central Asia. Uh, Madeleine is the author of uh, many books, I mean, of uh, Border Work, for example, Border Work, Special Lives of the State in Rural Central Asia, which was published uh, in 2014, and the editor of several volumes in political anthropology, including Marginal Hubs, which was actually edited with Magnus Martin. Uh, affective states with uh, Mateusz uh, Lachkowski and the everyday lives of sovereignty with Rebecca Bryant. Uh, she serves on the boards of a number of journals in anthropology, migration studies, and area studies, and uh, she's a former editor of Central Asian Survey. So we have chosen to uh, conduct this seminar today more in the form of a discussion rather than a uh, formal presentation of the volume by the editor. So what I'm going to do is that I will initiate the discussion with questions on the contents of the volumes and then each editor will answer and uh, we will have a Q&A session uh, uh, with, uh, with the audience. So please feel free uh, to send your, your question in, uh, in the chat box. So uh, let's start, uh, of course, uh, with uh, uh, the first question with a uh, brief introduction of the volume. So I'm going to ask each editor what was uh, the idea behind your book project, what is your volume about, uh, what did you want to do? So I don't know if Erika joined us. Is Erika here? Okay. Erika? You're muted. Yes, thank you. Uh, the host needed to unmute me. I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, I'm here. Um, okay, so I, it, I'm really delighted to be part of this community of editors of uh, new volumes, new handbooks. Um, I think um, the the our volume was Rico Isaacs, and Rico Isaacs was really the uh, the brain behind the volume, and I, I joined a little later in the production. Uh, but the point there was to reflect the, the richness of the Central Asian field uh, across disciplines, across countries, um, and to produce a good textbook for students. Um, and I think it is a good textbook. It turned out to be a great textbook because uh, it goes into pre-Soviet um, history briefly, and then uh, into politics, into various uh, social issues, um, religion, and then international relations. Uh, so it, it is a good um, introductory volume to whoever wants to access Central Asian field. Um, it goes, it, it provides basic information on um, various issues in the field and then it digs deeper. Uh, we have a diversity of authors uh, represented in this volume. And I teach this book already this semester. I think um, so far it's been a good experience. Yaron? Thank you. Um, so the idea behind our handbook came from my own experience when I was teaching um, Eurasian insights, uh, like Eurasia compared to a course on Central Asia political history, uh, that I, I found it so difficult to compile teaching materials uh, that were not too exhaustive. Like either they were too detailed and too much text for students for like a single topic. Um, There's no history that really matched, like uh, either it's, it's a modern history or it's a whole history. Uh, it's too much text, too much pages for students. So I wanted something more concise that also really adheres to learning outcomes when it's just not the facts, but also insights. And um, in the end, this was the main idea to generate something like that um, within the, the Erasmus Plus um, um, partnership, strategic partnership uh, in higher education that, that we launched uh, with, with uh, a group of uh, 11 universities, uh, 10 universities in, in the end uh, joined that consortium. So. The idea behind was uh, to really create uh, detective material um, for students at the level of students, 
but also for teachers. So it was very important that we didn't create a textbook that was stacked, that would go from one chapter and then based on the other, that students and, and teachers were bound to follow a certain parkour in creating, uh, like setting up their course curriculum and so on. So it's really like a Swedish buffet of 22 topics uh, with three introductions, one didactic and one about the, the maturing field and one about delineating Central Asia, which are like all guidelines for students and teachers, well, for any reader, what the book is going to be about and how it fits in uh, to Central Asian studies. And then the remaining 19 real hardcore topics. And since we were not bound by a word count so much, we actually were able to introduce topics and go quite deeply at the same time. Most of the work was uh, like for us editors, uh, together with Adrien Fauve and Bruno de Cordier, was integrating these chapters, make sure that not too many topics repeated themselves and actually uh, merging them through the use of info boxes and extended uh, recommendations for literature and so on. So, in a nutshell, the whole idea was really um, created from a very strong didactic dimension in which we did uh, some research on the existing learning outcomes of courses and modules in Central Asia. Uh, the same methodology was also yeah, imposed in a way on authors since the beginning uh, and then verified by the end to see that we actually did what we hoped out to do. So there was also a, like a verification and, and valid validification of the learning outcomes to see that they, they matched completely. And we added some boxes and some other uh, extra uh, documentation exercises, case studies at the end to make sure that we really covered the bulk of the learning out uh, outcomes necessary for most of the specialization in Central Asia. For us, history, uh, political science, and sociology anthropology. Yeah. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm going to stop here. Hmm? Thank you, Jeroen. David? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the, the impetus for me was was probably similar to everyone else in the sense of it, it came around engaging with students. Um, the real, the real um, I think, impetus began probably in 2010, 2011, uh, where um, I saw a number of students, um, I just was sort of struck by by what was an obvious question that was posed around why people would want to live in Central Asia. Um, because so much of the literature that people would read or that I would assign in a class painted a pretty grim picture. And, and so, which, you know, there, there's struggles in, in many places, but yet there's, a, you know, there's a lot of things that many of us like about Central Asia and, and that wasn't getting conveyed in, in classes. And, you know, so that led to, uh, a couple special issues, uh, 2013, 2014, around uh, so well-being as a category of analysis. And then um, there was an opportunity in 2014 to do a uh, workshop uh, between the University of Pittsburgh and uh, Carnegie Mellon University. It was a weekend, uh, mini, mini lecture, mini series on um, Muslims in Central Asia. And there was funding to bring in a, you know, a dozen Central Asianists over the weekend. Madeline was one of the people who came. And, um, and we presented uh, a crash course on Central Asia in, in, you know, to about 200 people. And that format became sort of the framework for what became the book. Uh, it was roughly around how I teach the book or how I would teach the class, right? Trying to get people to see that, you know, while we're talking about different components um, and however we teach, uh, really, you know, you, you can talk about religion, you can talk about politics, education, law, whatever. The reality of life is, is always sort of across those spaces that one needs to know a, a great deal of, of context to understand a place within any depth. And, and that, um, really became sort of a tension between looking at specific themes and how those themes are explanatory at one level, but also are complicated at another level. And the, um, you know, the hope was that the, the text would be useful for people teaching, um, but it is also, uh, you know, an awareness that um, there are people who work in the region or for, for a myriad of reasons who, who don't have access to um, sort of guided learning about a region or about, about uh, you know, the way in which they might in a class. And so 
it was intended in, in some respects as something that would be useful for people who are going to be in the region uh, and, and want to appreciate a bit more depth about how to look at a problem. Thank you, David. Madeleine? Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to take part, even though I think of all of the textbooks or all of the, the handbooks, um, the one that I'm co-editing with Jeanne is, is, is the one that is still sort of very much in, in progress. Um, it's very interesting hearing my colleagues speak, because for me too, part of the, the motivation, and I think I speak for Jeanne here as well, came from, from teaching and from a sort of sense that, um, certainly teaching on the anthropology of Central Asia, that there was a proliferating number of really great sort of in-depth, very detailed, very fine-grained ethnographic monographs, um, but that there wasn't necessarily a sort of a, a resource that you could easily direct students to um, who were studying the region sort of anthropologically where um, a lot of the, this, this sort of ethnographic insight was collectively gathered. So that was sort of certainly part of it was, was as, as, as my colleagues have said, coming from the experience of teaching and, and trying to find something that was neither sort of a simple sort of survey, you know, here are the states of Central Asia. I was going to say five states, but one of the topics I think we're going to touch upon is how we even define the region, right? Um, but something that was very, let's say, um, sort of didactic in its style on the one hand, or, or very, very detailed um, monographs that students couldn't necessarily um, read in a single week, right? You know, so, so, so finding something in between that. And then I think the other sort of source of motivation, um, again, this is coming from, from the disciplinary perspective of anthropology, was that I felt within the field of anthropology, um, and this was kind of conversations with my colleagues, more than with students perhaps, that the anthropology of Central Asia, I, I think is still sort of quite opaque to a lot of colleagues working in different world regions, right? Either it's sort of subsumed within, Eastern Europe is Eastern Europe is and is seen as somehow an extension of that. Um, but it, you know, there isn't a sort of um, there aren't kind of go-to resources or or, or, or books um, kind of in, in the anthropology of Central Asia in there in the way that there might be for other kind of world regions. And I was reminded um back in 2007, Maria Lu, and this was in the in the introduction to a beautiful um uh, monograph on the region, um, on everyday Islam, sort of described Central Asia as an anthropological no man's land. And I feel that's, that's no longer an adequate description, right? That was, that was 15 years ago, but I think it still can seem that way to colleagues in different fields. And actually part of the motivation then for us was to say, actually there's, some, there's been a, a ton of really great research, much of it still in, in dissertation form, um, or only just kind of beginning to be turned into publications from dissertation research. But if we look at the field today compared to 10 years ago, um, in terms of anthropological research, there's been a real flourishing of scholarship. And it was partly wanting to kind of showcase that and to, 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 to kind of bring that to a greater kind of comparative attention within the field of anthropology. So I guess for us, that's the other, that's the other motivation. Thank you very much, Madeleine. Uh, let's move now to a second question. Uh, what is or what was uh, the biggest challenge getting your book together? Did you encounter some specific difficulties? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Let's start with Erika. Okay, so coronavirus. Was <laughs> Um, some of our authors, especially uh, in Central Asia, they struggled with uh, the, in the midst of coronavirus when it hit um, Central Asian countries, but also the aftermath of it. Uh, it was a very difficult period, um, and 2020 was the time when a lot of our authors had to submit their art, uh, their chapters. Um, I also um, saw how we lost a lot more Central Asian authors, contributors along the way than Western contributors, and it made me think about some of the structural uh, issues in Central Asia that prevent uh, Central Asian scholars from working in, at the pace that uh, Western scholars work um, and submitting their works um, um, on the same uh, timeline as Western contributors. And uh, it made me think a lot about those structural issues. Um, I voiced some of them in the introductory, cha um, introductory chapter uh, for a special issue and Central Asian survey coming out this month. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so going forward, um, I think we need to be more aware of those uh, structural issues um, because um, they're, yeah, they're important if we want to include voices beyond the West. Yeah, really? Um, for us, the biggest problem was, um, yeah, getting everybody to conform to the didactic ideology that was driving this, this handbook from the beginning. And then, of course, um, for some reason or another, uh, we invented a quite difficult and unique style of referencing and with uh, footnotes apparatus with uh, in, uh, footnotes uh, in the margins and so on adapting or like having authors adapt to this and um, getting used to this system also took a while I had a lot of copy editing involved in order to, to set things straight at the end but this was quite a cha uh, quite challenging of course when the pandemic broke out we we're just halfway through so we had our first batch of uh, texts in uh, and we also lost a, a lot kind of a lot of coordination events uh, because of the pandemic because we were uh, holding two master classes for students within the framework of the ISCAS project so the European uh, Eurasian Insights Strengthening Central Asian Studies in Europe that was the name of the encompassing framework and uh, funding scheme in which the handbook uh, was created so we had two master classes one took place in 2019 as planned but the second one did not uh, in 2020, we tried to postpone it, but still didn't work. And it was also a way for all the authors, um, for most of the authors, to come and teach their handbook to a group of students, also as a kind of testing phase. And this was no longer possible with uh, because of the pandemic. We kind of lost the, the, the direct connection to, in mid-writing, uh, connect with authors, uh, like editors, students and authors and line them up and make sure that the expectations are calibrated correctly. So there was also some catch up to do afterwards uh, with the second batch of uh, authors. Um, and then other problems related to archives being closed and uh, authors having to wait until they had to open again. So the pandemic really had to hit the second batch of authors most. Um, and then, yeah, integrating, make sure that uh, uh, how do you get authors to complement their chapter to another chapter that they haven't read so this is also work for the editors um thank god we're we're three of the uh three of us there in that regard i can't imagine doing this uh uh on my own or or you know like i'm very happy we had uh at least the whole editorial team that was almost in non-stop communication during these last years um, so uh, yeah so integrating the chapters that was uh that was the biggest challenge for sure thank you david so I was thinking about it. I mean, I think there were really three three challenges. They're all all related, and, and some uh, touch upon what both Joran and, and Eric mentioned. Right. One was, of course, getting contributors. Um, you um, you know, I, I, we had the frame out of the you know a, a, a good core of contributors from the the mini course that we had done earlier. Um, but then you know people's lives get complicated. They they want to do things. They're not able to do things. Things come up that are unexpected, and so you um, sort of shift that. Um, and uh, you know I think fortunately uh, I had a number of people who were um, willing to do it and, and contribute. But it was um, it was always a moving target. Um, part of that was my own fault. I mean, I think that it was me being very committed to a particular structure. Um, the structure being uh, sort of breaking up the book into eight parts um, that broke, looked at sort of different context of things, whether it was history, structure, living, and such. Um, and then within that, uh, within each of those parts, there were seven chapters. Four were thematic. Um, so, you know, looking at, uh, you know, the one I mentioned, uh, Madeline uh, contributed. So you know, that was in the context of living part. And there was chapters on rural life, urban life, migratory life, diaspora life. But then within that, there were three cases that were um, trying to complica complicate sort of the, this sort of more focused look at a, at a problem. And, and that include, you know, a case for, from Sebastian on, on Turkmenistan, um, a case on Tajikistan uh, and a case on, uh, you know, education and, and, and Kyrgyzstan. And so, um, you know, it was because of that commitment to a particular structure, uh, the book didn't come out, you know, in 2018. I mean, it was sort of, uh, you know, not, um, certainly there were probably enough contributors to bring a book out then, but it was, like I said, being committed to that. And then, 
And then I think the last complication really was uh, cost. I was really concerned about the cost of the book and, uh, and the book became very large. Uh, it, it, um, the, it, so the solution that we came to was, was breaking it up into two parts, a, a text volume and uh, an online notes volume. And I, I, uh, while that process was quite complicated, I, I can't uh, thank the, the press enough because they were really um, dedicated to trying to keep the cost down. And um, what that ended up being though, is that we had to sort of separate and restructure how the notes were being done within the text. So um, the book would have been out early 2020 had we not done that. But I think the, the end result is, is one that I'm, I'm happy with and that it's a relatively affordable uh, you know, text volume of around eight, you know, 800 pages, uh, but then a, a separate notes volume that is digital and will be available for free. But I also think that one of the things that was nice about that process is that the, um, the notes volume ends up being something close to an annotated volume, annotated notes, uh, which I think for the discerning reader, it can really give a sense of the infrastructure of the book itself. And um, you know, those were the challenges that delayed it uh, significantly, but in the end, um, uh, I think the book turned out okay. Thank you, David Madeleine. Thanks. Yeah, um, I think a lot of the things have already been raised and certainly what Erica said at the beginning about the kind of the differential impacts of the pandemic um, as that impacted scholars from the region, but also as that impacted upon scholars with caring responsibilities and so forth. I think um, that had a, that had so certainly was one of the major challenges, um, because, again, 2020, 2021 were, were, were the major periods of submitting chapters and then of working through revisions and um, I would say that disproportionately affected um, contributors from Central Asia. Um, so that's, I think, something, those structural issues, I, I totally agree with Erica, are really important things for us to think about. And in addition, I think um, a lot of our contributors are, are, are at relatively early career stages and so are also in, in very often in kind of structurally precarious situations in terms of job markets and so forth, and in terms of the kinds of constraints and pressures that they might be under in terms of where they publish. And, um, you know, uh, publishing, contributing to an edited collection, even if that's going to be widely read or used in teaching and so forth and have a lot of visibility in the classroom, doesn't necessarily count in the same way as, say, a field-specific journal publication. So that's also, you know, um, uh, impacted some of our authors, or at least, you know, it was, was a reason why certain people declined to contribute. And then I think there are certain um, kind of field-specific things that I would want to draw attention to. One is that there's, there's an imbalance in the anthropological production of knowledge about Central Asia, right? There's a lot more research being conducted in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. So one of our challenges was how to kind of actually have some 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 balance, um, a, a, you know, across across the region that we're covering. There is very little anthropological scholarship on Turkmenistan, for instance, just because of issues of of access and so forth. Um, and then we wanted, I think, to also honor and respect the different scholarly traditions that our contributors were coming from. We had um, we've got a wide range of scholars from from different scholarly traditions. We've translated a number of um, contributions from, from Russian, from French, and we wanted to kind of um, honor the fact that those traditions have distinct kind of styles of presenting ethnography and theory to recognize that and, and not to kind of force people into one size fits all for what we were looking at. And yet, to, and yet to aim for scholarly coherence. So I think that's been, you know, for, for our volume, one of the things that we've been thinking about a great deal. And then just a final thing that relates to that is again, we were wanting with our with our contr um, contributions, and they're all original chapters, um, to to really be ethnographically grounded and yet sort of speak to wider issues. And I think that's that's quite a challenge for the authors. I mean, for, for any author, right? Of of trying to bring in the ethnographic specificity that derives from research and yet um, also pro produce a text that may be accessible to somebody who isn't familiar with the very specific research field that you're writing about. And so that's a question of sort of, of style, of framing of, of, of evidence and so forth. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the challenges, certainly within the constraints of relatively short 
chapters, um, you know, for, for a big volume of this kind. Thank you, Madeleine. Uh, now, a third and I guess important question would be what insights uh, did you encounter about Central Asian studies as a field? I mean, when creating the handbook, you know, in, including uh, theoretical questions, methodological issues. Uh, Erika? Right. Okay. So, lots of insights. Um, and I'll just I will highlight just a couple of them. The first insight that was obvious uh, from uh, compiling this this handbook, and again, we tried to include as many authors from Central Asia as we could. I think about a third or more are from Central Asia, although we tried to include more than that, um, is that there is really a growing gap between what produced in the West and the conversations in Central Asia, and we're on the cusp of uh, Central Asian scholars. And by that, I'm saying scholars based in the region and the diaspora scholars like myself um, of uh, actively challenging Western perspectives and looking into how is it that we would interpret Central Asia outside of the influence and the dominance of uh, first Russian interpretation, Soviet interpretation and, and uh, Western interpretations. And this, uh, this is going to be, I think, the, uh, this will be the highlight of the next decade of how scholars in Central Asia are now going to be not so much even in dialogue uh, with Western perspectives, but creating their own understanding um, outside of, um, outside of the dominant discourse that we um, are accustomed to when it comes to Central Asia. And in this regard, we can no longer call Central Asian region as unknown or little known or not interesting <laughs> or unimportant because it is important and it is, it is very well known, maybe not uh, from the outside perspective, but definitely in Central Asia. And this realization, this understanding, this acknowledgement and um, the agency of a production of knowledge is really rising in Central Asia. And that's something new to be uh, dealt with in the next decade. And to me, um, this is one of the um, silver linings of pandemic as well, because a lot of the Central Asian scholars connected online um, and compared notes, compared grievances and frustrations. Uh, with each other and are now, I think there is a critical mass of scholars and I see some of them are here um, in the audience as well, who are now taking agency over what is, um, how, how Central Asia is depicted uh, from the Central Asian perspective as well. And to me, this is really this defining moment that I see in Central Asia that we saw in other post-colonial regions. Um, for instance, in India in the 1980s, it took about three to four decades for post-colonial perspectives to really gain this uh, international momentum and uh, to push back against dominant perspectives. And this is not to uh, really undermine or cancel or whatever of, you know, so Western perspectives. This is not, that's not the point here at all. The point here that there should be a dialogue and the, um, the debates on Central Asia should not take just within uh, Western perspectives, but there should be a um, continuous dialogue and proactive um, understanding of all of the field, uh, not just what is published by major university press ho houses um, in the West. So to me, this was the moment of realization uh, concurrent to um, compiling uh, this handbook and uh, being in conversation with other scholars in Central Asia. Thank you, Erika. Yara? For us, we early on, after surveying, uh, surveying different uh, course curricula syllabi and so on, we found actually that um, there's not much material out there that really guides um, the teaching of Central Asia, like methodology, like from a didactic point of view. Like scholars do fantastic jobs on their own, eh? but there is no, there's not much dissemination in, in how an individual scholar 
uh, or teacher or educator um, does things and, and yeah, uh, disseminates the best practices. So what we found after digging through the, 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 the course uh, the syllabi, that all the learning outcomes are based on knowledge and almost nothing is based on skills and competences and even less on changing attitudes in classroom settings. So this is very hard to do through reading, of course, uh, so the, the classroom setting is necessary for that. But we were extra attentive with our authors to actually focus on these elements while framing our, our, our chapters. And then the second challenge that, that, that also uh, led to some insights is that, yeah, the choice that we make, how to define Central Asia, how to present it to our, our target audience, teachers and students in Europe, because that's what the, the funding mandate uh, uh, gave us. Um, like we opted for the very narrow definition of, of the, the, the five uh, former Soviet states. Uh, but then again, not all, of, not all of your chapters fit in there, right? The more historic you go. And while mapping these different approaches, uh, we really found out that uh, if we use the fully Eurasian wider perspective, it has the aim of actually connecting Central Asia with its surrounding uh, civilization, cultures, and so on. If you take the Central Asia plus, like the, the, the core region plus northern, uh, northern Iran, Afghanistan, Xinjiang and, and southern Russia, you do this in order to really cut out and uh, highlight the distinctiveness of, of the region. But if you focus only on the five countries or uh, in other cases on, on individual countries like Afghanistan and so on, uh, you do this to highlight the transformation, uh, the, 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 the change that has been taking place in this specific, uh, specific territory. And like after reading all these chapters, uh, editing them, putting them together, integrating them, we really found that because we, we had um, a focus in, in what Central Asia studies uh, should be, uh, like the, the focus we are going to use for, for each chapter, but we uh, did allow authors when necessary to deviate from this so long as they, they motivate their, their decisions. And allowing this to present this to students in one of our introductions, We've, I found that very insightful to say, like, we have these different approaches, they all serve a different purpose, they all have blind spots, they all have uh, advances and disadvantages. And presenting this in like a concise way to students, I think is definitely one of the contributions that we were able to do in order to guide and reinterpret all the following chapters that we had in our book. Um, but all of this came, of course, from the, the didactic drive that, that, uh, and the, the groundwork we did there before we even started writing. Uh, so, um, so that's definitely the, the major insight. Uh, and then the other insights are definitely listed uh, at, um, yeah, as summaries by each author themselves, uh, guiding uh, readers further in um, consulting this literature or that. So, so they're definitely much more. But as a major insight is like how to approach it, I hope that we can really, yeah, uh, help teachers and readers along by understanding the different approaches and, and having them choose their own way to move forward and using our handbook as a, yeah, um, as an optional tool uh, in order to cherry pick the topics that they need to do their thing with their approach and, and, and their goals. Thank you, Jeroen. David? Yeah, so in terms of the um, sort of relation of Central Asia as a field, um, or Central Asian studies as a field. I'm, I'm not entirely sure um, how to think about it. I think one of the things that I've always uh, been really happy about with the group of, of Central Asian scholars is that it's really relatively interdisciplinary. Um, people, part of that I think had to do with the, uh, the development uh, being more recent than in some other areas. Uh, but I think that what you find is you have people who are reading across disciplines and there are friendships, relationships, collaborations that take place across disciplines. And um, for me, that's something that's quite special and important about um, whatever we might characterize as Central Asian studies. Um, yeah, you know, anything, anything outside of, uh, you know, anything that's coherent outside of, of a, an emphasis on the region um, often ends up being quite disciplinary in its in its approach, and uh, if you look at other regional area studies, and um, that struck me as as important and noteworthy about uh, you know people who focus on the region. It's also something that I hope doesn't get lost because um, as uh, you know, there are pressures to um, uh, you know within academia to to produce within a discipline. And, uh, and so, 
you know, for me, I hope that that doesn't get lost because I think it's a richer way of looking at problems and one that uh, should be should be appreciated and encouraged. Madeleine? Thanks. Yeah, I'm just going to focus on, on, on one issue. I and mean, like Erica, I think there are many, many issues that kind of this really made me reflect upon. But I think one is, is also the sort of the overdetermination of our study of um, Central Asia as a region. And for the purpose of, of um, the, the book that I'm co-editing with Jeanne, we, we included Xinjiang and, and Afghanistan. But the overdetermination of sort of certain issues, which are also, I think, dictated by um, policy agendas, by funding priorities, and so forth. So, um, you know, uh, uh, issues of 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 conflict, of resource conflict, of interethnic conflict, of radicalization, and so forth. And how how, in a sense, these paradigms have, I think, um, and these priorities have perhaps inflected the kinds of questions that as scholars. Um, um, that you know have been have been researched, or that that kind of come to be associated with the region in public life, and so one of our kind of I guess concerns with this with this volume was also to to disrupt that um, to the extent that's possible, you know, with with a single volume by um, showing how um, the sort of saliency of, of of scholarship that might be on other kinds of themes entirely, and 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 the. the the saliency both for sort of wider debates, but also for thinking about the kind of the issues that matter to people from, from the region. So um, I think that's one of the sort of things that that really made me aware of is how, um, how sort of public knowledge of, 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 of the region has been um, um, sort of shaped by certain external um, agendas and the impacts of that. Um, but also it's made me aware of um, within kind of the, the the anthropological field, sort of certain areas that are comparatively under research, certain thematic areas. So there's you know issues around um, the anthropology of health, of um, um, certain issues around certain themes within environmental anthropology. You know, there's 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 also sort of certain thematic areas where um, I think there's just you know um, you know there's there's still uh, um, a lot of scholarship that, you know, and, 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 and lots of things to be explored. Sorry, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madeleine. So maybe a uh, last, uh, fourth and last question uh, to, to open the debate. I just would like to remind, so please feel free to send your, your questions uh, in the chat box. We'll have a few minutes to, to address them in the end of this, uh, this event. So the fourth uh, uh, question would be uh, to open a little bit the debate is how is uh, Central Asian Studies maturing? What still needs to be done? Let's start with Erika. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so one of the ways um, you, well, one of the ways we can continue to enrich our understanding of Central Asia is to go beyond, um, look beyond of what is published um, in our usual in the usual formats that are most um, convenient and familiar to us. Let's say peer-reviewed journals or um, edited volumes or books published by university press houses. Um, and this is a learning process to me as well, because um, I'm kind of in between two worlds, right? Um, not Western enough, but not Central Asian enough, and yet uh, kind of having stakes in both, um, both worlds. Um, but looking at knowledge production in, uh, for instance, in art, there is so much activist and post-colonial, decolonial ways of reimagining Central Asia through art. Um, that's one of the ways of understanding Central Asia, through podcasts, through uh, discussions, uh, because the conversations are on ongoing and there is a lot of knowledge transferred and generated outside of uh, peer reviewed journals. And this is our challenge. How do we capture this wealth of knowledge to better understand the region and to enrich our discussions. Um, just go beyond of the published text and to see, to, to find and see new ways, uh, different ways of uh, knowledge production in Central Asia that, is, that are not as familiar to us um, as those well-published handbooks. That's all for me. Thank you, Rika. Yeru? 
We had a lot of discussions on where the field is going and so on, if it's maturing or not. The fact that we're together here presenting four handbooks is definitely like at a scholarly level that uh, we are feeling uh, a rising demand of that. A lot has been produced through traditional channels, uh, uh, traditional challenge, uh, have channels but that it is uh, highly speci uh, specialized and very fragmented according to different disciplines. And I think all our four handbooks are a way to like integrate this knowledge and make it more accessible to the new generation coming behind us, uh, following us. Uh, and this group is really changing. So we've also been researching um, in a separate activity of the, the ICAS project. Um, like we're creating curriculum design recommendations that will come out in, in one or two weeks. That's going to be the final output of our project. Um, so we've also been serving students, um, both Central Asian students uh, working in Europe, uh, um, US students, or like the students from all different backgrounds and also different educators through, through surveys and interviews, asking them how we can reimagine Central Asian studies from the education point of view. And one of the things we found is that Throughout the years, the confusion is still there. Like self-identifying as a Central Asian scholar is already difficult. And then doing that from the like your own identity of being of the region, not of the region, uh, part of the diaspora is what complicated is uh, uh, at that like gender dimensions, post-colonial factor. It's really difficult to, to figure out what you're doing and where you're going and how to fit in and, and make a career out of it and what to do after your studies and what study programs are available. So I think that in order, the next step is actually is, uh, in, if you want to help the next generation, I think we need more study, uh, student coaching, uh, kind of like mitigating and presenting the expectations of the new generation of, of students and what they can expect when studying, the choice they make in going for this topic, that topic, staying in this discipline, and also what is life like if you do not stay in academia? Uh, because there's so many different ways of, of using uh, your expertise in Central Asia study, uh, like on Central Asia, um, continuing to work in different sectors and there's so much confusion and most students figure this out in their own. Huh? So, so there's a, they, they, they have to, right? But um, in order like to, to, to limit disappointment and, and make students make better and better strategic choices, I think student coaching, uh, more work should be done there uh, in order to, to, to help the, like protect and guide to the, the next cohort of, of specialists that are, which is a growing group and a more diverse group than it ever was. Huh? So, uh, and I think this might be also a role for our study associations to, 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 to connect in this regard, uh, transboundary, transregionally, to actually come up with, um, yeah, uh, some more like, like more exchange of best practices in how to guide students in, in, into the study field and then, yeah, the professional life afterwards. Uh, that, that's one of the things that I still see that's definitely still missing when it comes to Central Asian studies. Um, as an interdisciplinary uh, field. Thank you very much, Aaron. David? So if, we, if we're talking about sort of the way in which uh, Central Asian Studies is changing and our engagement with is changing, I think that, um, you know, I'll just sort of pick up on a few things that you are and Eric had mentioned. It's that, you know, it's interesting, we all began with sort of the same uh, premise of uh, engaging with students and how do they learn about the region. I think that there's, um, there's an awareness that um, you know resources are becoming better to be able to do that, but but both you know the the environment in which students are entering the university and the university environment uh, they're both changing quite a bit, right? So there's movement within movement around these things, and um, you know so for me there's always been an interest around the a distinction between knowledge of things and knowledge for things, and. I think Jorn's right. There's a lot of people who will learn about the region, who are taught taught about the region, who aren't going to be academics. Um, so, so how is the way in which they engage about the region going to be useful rather than just a one-off thing? They've learned something about a place that they didn't know much about beforehand, right? And I think that you know the reason I enter I emphasize the interdisciplinarity aspect of Central Asian Studies as being something really unique and important is I I think that's a really useful skill 
that students can take away with how they look at problems, how they think about problems, especially as they, um, as they try to um, do something with what they learn outside of the university, after the university. I, I would imagine, uh, and certainly I, I hope, I, I think we see some of this already, is that among uh, you know, scholars who are engaging with the, the region, it's, it's also, um, you know, there is sort of an activist uh, view on things, right? It's not just describing the world, but describing and, and conceptualizing ways of improving living conditions for people. Um, and, and I think that that, um, that sort of more applied intellectual engagement is, is, is perhaps the next step of where we, or at least where I would hope people start to engage, right? That we move from, from being comfortable within a university um, or within intellectual discussions that we have, that we start to figure out ways of applying that in ways of uh, improving lives locally. So just a few thoughts, I think that, you know, are starting, but I, I hope they continue. Thank you very much, David. Madeleine? Thanks, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. I, um, because on the one hand, we can say, yeah, we have a really maturing field and the fact that there are, you know, multiple handbooks or textbooks that are, um, you know, with, with, with dozens of authors, this is a sort of sign of this maturing field. And I think if we, if we simply sort of look in terms of, um, um, I don't know, let's say doctoral dissertations defended that, you know, broadly have to do with the region, we can, we can sort of, we can, we can sort of, uh, sort of feel quite positive about that. On the other hand, I think if, you know, I, I was thinking um, about, say, the, the contributors to, to our volume and just thinking, I was just thinking sort of through the list of authors and thinking what, what proportion of those scholars who've been producing fantastic fieldwork are in precarious academic positions or precarious positions full stop, right? Um, and I think what we have to also do is to kind of really draw attention to the structural barriers to um, career progression more generally, right? This is not something that's confined to the field of Central Asian, um, you know, the Central Asian region, but I think it, 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 it takes particular forms and perhaps, you know, there are ways in which it's particularly visible in our field, right? The number of um, scholars who've produced fantastic work on the region as doctoral scholars, as postdocs, um, who aren't um, uh, able to get permanent academic positions and so forth. So these are these are issues that are, I think, very much tied to um, um, cultures of of hiring. And we, I think we, you know, I think there needs to be real interrogation of of, of um, the sort of implicit and explicit ways in which um, people are excluded from from permanent um, academic positions and so forth. So I think there are these these sort of broader structural issues. Um, that that we you know need to address and that we need to sort of think about the 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 the, the kind of the field as it's institutionalized in organisations like CESS and so on. Um, so I'll leave it there. I'm sure there's there's a lot of you know, there's a lot more that could be said, um, but I'll I'll leave it at that to leave a little space for discussion. Thank you very much, Madeleine. Thank you. I mean, so the four of you for I mean your introductions and uh, your, your your discussion yeah we have a few minutes for 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 discussion so we have uh, some questions of course the first one would be uh is the simultaneousness of uh, the four volumes a coincidence or are there some important reasons for that i mean uh, does anyone any one of you have could uh, answer that please Anyone? <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, I, I guess it's it's probably a bit of both. I mean, um, I think you know some of us were aware, aware about other projects that folks were working on. Others were working on projects when we we found about it as as you know they were ongoing concurrently. And I I suspect part of it is is sort of the you know growing awareness of wanting to uh, produce things that would be useful for people coming up through the ranks or through, you know, through their studies. Um, so, so that is, uh, you know, that probably just happened by chance, but also a nature of, of timing as to where things were. And then probably the, the production schedules and such being what they were, um, different events happened that, that sort of made them somehow coincide, but uh, it's hard to say. 
Anyone wants to add anything? Yeah, just to add, I mean, I think that it was coincidental to the extent that there wasn't a sort of like a, you know, <laughs> a plan or a, or, a, or, a, or a conversation, though I think at various points we became aware of, of other projects. Um, but I think it does reflect perhaps a sort of, um, yes, yeah, you know, common experiences um, in terms of, of teaching, but also um, an awareness of sort of wanting to, to perhaps create fora for for bringing some of those those conversations that were happening perhaps precisely sort of online or in corridors or or in in other kinds of spaces into more um into more public fora thank you yeah, I, I, I sorry add, go ahead, I mean, go ahead. Think, sorry sebastian i didn't mean to no, speak no over but I, I might add that i think there are there are others i mean i know at least of of, of one or two other people who are who are working on um uh, books that would be also useful for 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 teaching Central Asian studies, and um, so you know, I don't think we're unique in that. I think it's probably uh, just an issue of timing and awareness of needs. Thank you, David. Uh, another question we received is: What is one of the most uh, challenging, intrinsic uh, Central Asian perspectives by Central Asian scholars themselves that causes not Central Asian scholars serious heartburn? Uh, Erika, do you want to answer? Okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. I think it, the question itself is very problematic. Let's not ask questions like this. Let's engage in discussions instead of uh, feelings of heartburn. Um, I think uh, the problem here is just the opposite. Whenever, or very often, I think Central Asian scholars um, at joint forums, let's say conferences, when uh, the challenge or question uh, dominant perspectives, be they um, Soviet, Russian, Western, they considered, you know, they, 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 it's, it, it happened very often. It's not just, you know, something that I imagined, but I, I've seen this and I've heard it from other people um, that it's dismissed as naive, uh, nativist, nationalist, and not taken uh, seriously um, as serious scholarship. So I think, um, I think if anything, we need to be more uh, open and sensitive to uh, different interpretations as unorthodox as they may sound to us. And, there, uh, and by the way, um, there are really some amazing perspectives are now rising uh, from Central Asia. Um, I really encourage you to read um, a, um, an article that is coming up again in Central Asian Survey special issue by Bodokoska Sembekova who challenges this whole idea of uh, modernism uh, during uh, Soviet Union um, and the ideas that uh, Soviet states, the, the borders of Soviet states were negotiated by uh, elites. And she questions this whole notion of whose voices are we listening to um, that the, you know, the Soviet regime was really brutal and no modernist, and, and the modernist narrative itself is very colonial towards Central Asia. So these kind of perspectives are rising. And I really hope that uh, we as a society of scholars are more open to those uh, perspectives. Another great article is coming by Asil Tutumlu also uh, in that special issue, who also disentangles some of the persistent tropes about Central Asia. And I hope these kind of perspectives are not dismissed as heartburn. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone wants to add? Yeah, you're go ahead. Yeah, I'm also looking at this question, I, I felt this is this question really poses a divide uh, between, between uh, native scholars and, 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 and non-Central Asian scholars. Um, yeah. We need more bridges, I would say. Uh, um, there definitely are challenges to, to, to uh, non-Central Asian scholars. Like, for instance, the, the learning of local languages is so important and something that, that has so much investment is needed uh, to do that. But then again, Central Asian scholars have other needs that the same society should also find funding and means for uh, to answer, uh, ranging from, yeah, freedom of speech fully without repercussions at home while being there, uh, to more funding, to more access to mainstream, to changing the expectations and uh, the format, uh, uh, the, the mainstream format, which doesn't always fit um, every scholar from every discipline in, and so on. Um, there's so much to, to, to that needs to be done. It's 
yeah, I, I, we need to reframe this no longer as a competition uh, of, of, of who has the best chances of, of publishing. And yeah, I think we have to adapt um, and, and make sure that like we need to meet uh, the needs of, 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 of different segments of uh, the Central Asian society that we normatively hope we know it's divided we know it's fragmented we know it's unequal but that we at least as an idea hope to integrate and 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 yeah as as a more equalitarian and and democratic uh group uh, so uh so this question is yeah um yeah it, it, it's the wrong question i also think i also think that it's, it pins more to the antagonism than 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 to the, the unity that we need to go the to move towards so Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, we are running out of time, but maybe let me ask, if you don't mind, a last question, which I think is important. It's about, <clears throat> excuse me, the funding, I mean, funding your book project. I mean, do available grant streams allow for encourage a real collaboration among scholars from the region and outside, and for those who have secure position with those who are in precarious positions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if I like, because we worked with a grant scheme and so on, and I must say the grant schemes are not friendly to really integrating the different groups. Uh, like we had so many restrictions from our European mandate to European funding for European institutions that as a result, we don't have so many Central Asian schol uh, scholars as others. Uh, we, I'm very happy with the people that we found and they're all experts in their field. So for the quality of the book, this is really great, but for optics, it's not. And, um, and there's no way around that. Uh, the, the, the funding mandates are clear. Uh, you can only um, send money to, to European institutions. It was very hard to involve uh, some, some, some ones out of the region. So it's, yeah, uh, but at least these funding schemes that actually allow you to pay your authors uh, can be helpful from, from uh, also to, to, to get some people out of precarity. Uh. Um, here, of course, the funding was also had its limits because we could only actually employ people with a strong formal link to the institution, which of course biases the group of others to establish scholars at institutions in Europe. Uh, so, and this is fine for um, the handbook mandate that we had, is creating a, a, a handbook, a basic handbook uh, for students, for teachers, uh, like uh, as an introduction, to, uh, like an advanced introduction to uh, uh, linking this up with online lectures and, and all the other didactic uh, uh, bells and hongs that we, we added to, to our handbook. Um, but uh, to integrate different groups across the divides, I don't think there are many funding schemes possible. Um, and if they are, they're too policy oriented. And this, of course, brings in its own problems. So it's no longer for education. It's no longer for integration. It's it's really, it has some specific political agendas, which also really bias uh, the outcomes of, of, of larger funding schemes. Uh, so this is definitely something, yeah, uh, that's, yeah, the Central Asian society community is also like a victim of uh, that, that uh, the biases that are inherent, structurally inherent to, to the, the funding schemes. Yeah, Thank I might you. add, I, you know, yeah. I, I spent a couple of years look, trying to look for subvention grants, um, and uh, it's really hard to do that. I mean, I think that academics um, are expected that they write for free. Um, and, and in in reality, that means that a lot of this stuff is done on the side and, you know, it's people's goodwill um, and interest as a whole that puts it together. I mean, uh, I don't think this is unique to this this volume. I think it's a challenge that, um, you know, there is no funding available for any of this stuff. And I think you're right that it, when there is, it's there are other expectations that are politically driven. Um, so I think funding is a problem. All right, thank you. I just maybe give uh, uh, any one of you a chance to say final word if you wish. I mean, Madeleine, uh, Erika, Jeroen, David, you want to add anything? I'm happy to just come up with a couple of quick comments. What, one on the on the um, <clears throat> on the sort of the configuration of the field. I think one thing that's very sort of also very visible in anthropology is that there isn't a single sort of Western anthropological discourse around Central Asia. Um, 
there are very different scholarly traditions, say in Japan, in, in Russia, in France, um, uh, in Germany, um, in the US, and the UK, there, each, you know, there, there are these kind of quite distinctive anthropological um, traditions. And actually one of the things that we really wanted to try and do in our volume was to, 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 to provide a space um, to, to, to kind of allow that, to, that those different traditions to be visible. I mean, just on the funding, um, I agree. I mean, it's it's we didn't have a sort of a dedicated funding stream for this volume, and we weren't paying our our authors. Um, and I agree that usually when you do have that such a such a model, it comes with a lot of strings attached. But it does mean that. Um, yeah, sort of everybody was doing this project, you know, as, 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 as an act of goodwill or as a sort of because they believed in it or because from an individual perspective, it was, um, you know, they, they wanted to have their research sort of published, but it does create then real challenges, um, not least, and I think this isn't something we haven't yet mentioned, but it's related to these issues of, of kind of structural inequality and access and so forth, is how these volumes then are accessible to a reader, right? You know, the, the, the marketing strategy of the publishing companies and the pricing and so forth and, and whom this excludes and whom this includes. So these are, you know, I think really important wider issues that we need to, that we need to think about, um, you know, that aren't sort of unique to this field, but are but are reflected in this kind of knowledge form of knowledge production. Thank you, Madeleine. Erika, your own, uh, Davin, a final word, or should we conclude? Yeah, uh, also regarding the funding, there is also a positive side to funding. Uh, uh, one of the results is that our handbook is open access. So even if it was, had a mandate to serve European institutions, Western institutions, European institutions, European students and, and, and teachers, it is out there open for everybody. The videos are out there uh, on, on YouTube and can be used. Um, so this is definitely, I hope, like because this project is ending, it's the final month, uh, like uh, at the end of December, we will be closing it. And, and as, uh, it was 40 months of heavy in the interaction and collaboration. And I'm very happy we can leave this out there for everybody open and free to use and free to adapt. Uh, and uh, this is one of the advantages. And I'm very grateful that, that the whole scheme worked and that we actually also were able to, to, to finalize it in such a way that uh, it can benefit other people outside the EU as well. That was also important uh, to us. So, Thank you, Jeroen. Erika, David, you want to add anything? Yes, Erika, go ahead. Um, sure, um, I agree with everything uh, with Madeline and Jeroen said. Um, on the structural and quality to um, and quality of accessing uh, knowledge and everything and our volume is notoriously very expensive although the digital version is somewhat cheaper um i think uh it's interesting what madeline said about uh, different traditions and anthropology i think there is a little more of a division in political science and um even history historiography uh, studies uh of uh yeah uh, IR and studies of Islam and studies of um, Soviet history. I think there has been a clear divide and that's something that is currently being pushed against now uh, by some of the perspectives in Central Asia. I just want to end this note by uh, saying that um, it's a great moment to study Central Asia as, a, um, as an area um, without thinking and necessarily being uh, anxious about what are the policy implications for the United States or um, would it be interesting or not? Um, or even, and that's my pushback against uh, some of the conferences focusing on Central Asia, even theoretical contribution of Central Asian studies to uh, major disciplines. I think that it's okay sometimes not to have a theoretical contribution to political science, um, IR sociology, but just trying to understand the area through and through. Uh, and that's, there is so much value just in that. Um, and that's something that I'm trying to convey to my students as well, that understanding an area has so much value on its own as well. Um, for you as a scholar, as a policymaker, um, or just as a human being on this <laughs> really populist note. <laughs> that's my, uh, th this is the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Erika. And David, do you want to add anything? Nothing substantive. I'll just thank everyone for their time.
All right. So yes, unfortunately, we're ready to conclude. So I would really like to thank our uh, four speakers for being with us today, but not only for being with us, but also for their huge work. I mean, on these uh, volumes, I mean, these four books, I think, are really great news. I mean, they really demonstrate uh, huge interest in Central Asia. And as Erika was uh, saying, I mean, we cannot say that uh, Central Asia is not a region of interest anymore. It's not an unknown, uh, is an unknown region. Uh, it also, they also show the diversity of scholars, and I'm sure that these books will bring a substantial uh, food for thought for uh, scholars working on Central Asia and also beyond Central Asia. So uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you. I would like to thank also our audience for uh, being with us today. And uh, we look forward to having you again in our Central Asian program seminars. Have a good day. Have a good evening and see you very soon. Thank you very, very much. Bye.